Hang on one second. I think that I haven't turned on the screen behind me. So good morning, everybody. There's um, a sign-in sheet I'm passing around for attendance rather than calling it today. Okay? So just sign it. I'll make sure to mark you here. Feeling better? Good. Um, so this is what I thought the plan would be this for this morning unless you desire something different which is, I'm assuming there might be a few questions on chapter two or three that you might want reviewed. Um, if we have time, you might want me to introduce chapter four and five because we only come to class next week on Wednesday because Monday's a holiday. Um, let's see, the screen behind me is on. Let me call attention to this. Let me turn off the light a sec. Um, so here we are. <clears throat> Notice that we have the chapter three video here. And then if you go to next week, because you won't be here on Monday, there's a video for doing what's called the teacup assignment. And there's a video on um, the tabs and tables. But let me take a look at your due date. Yeah, your due date is not Wednesday, right? I knew it was going to be a hard one. Um, right, so chapters four and five, your due date. <coughs> oh. Hmm. Right, tabs and tables is hard. That's why I gave you extra time. <laughs> it's a hard chapter. It's hard to get your arms around it. It really is. And chapter four, I wanted to make sure that you had some demo so you have the due date. But what I thought I'd do today, if I come back to the home page, what I thought I'd do today is review whatever you need to wrap up two and three, introduce four if I can to you, so you could get started on it while you're away. Because like I've always said, you just don't want to lose ground in this class. You just don't. Because once you do, it's, you know, it's not good. And then, um, I forgot your name in the back. Is it Karina? Laura. And Laura and I cut a deal that at 9.30 I'm going to stop and we're going to demo how to combine multiple PDF files into one and how to upload to Moodle to make sure everybody's going to do that correctly. And so you'll have from, let's say, 9.45 till class is over at 10.20 to make sure you've uploaded all your work on time. Okay? Um, so, so how does that work for everybody? It's cool? Okay. So, um, are there questions? I, I can see some people frantically working, so I forgot your name over there. Questions, or do you want me just to move forward? Are there any questions about chapter two or chapter three? Not a one? Everybody's good with it? Really? Okay, Laura, were you able to move your PDF files to my flash drive yet? Okay, then you know what? Laura's going to come up here and demo this just to make sure we're all good. Then do you mind bringing the flash drive up here, Laura? You just need it for one chapter, because if you do it for one, you'll have it for the okay. rest, right? OK. And then she's going to demo that. And then since there's no questions for a chapter, so how many people have not uploaded chapter two and three yet? I've not uploaded three. You haven't uploaded three yet. OK. So just Tony. 
Everybody else has uploaded. All right, that's awesome. All right, then how about this? Um, Laura's going to do this demo for us about combining multiple PDFs into one. And then I will demo chapter four only, right, to get you started on it. And, um, and then I'll give you lab time. Does that sound right for all of you? That's good. Okay. You ready, Laura? Yeah. All right. Chapter four is fun. Okay. Let's stick it in the back here. Have a seat. Just set it down. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. Laura's teaching us today. There we go. All right. No, no, you're doing it, not me. It's all you. Um, here, we're going to put you on video, too. Smile at the camera that you can't see. All right. Okay. So we have this flash drive that loaded right here. Here we go. And Laura took her folders, and she put all of... Look at how organized she is. This is like... This is applause worthy. It is. <laughs> it is. It's exactly how organized you should all look. She has on her computer all of the package files. On here, she just moved all of her um, all of her PDF files. So never work off your flash drive. So right now, I'm just dragging her folders. Did you put them all on here? Chapter three. Yeah. I, I oh, okay. So we're good. All right. Never work off a flash drive because it could crash on you. So always drag things to the hard drive. Okay, so Laura, it's going to be so easy. You're going to be so happy. I'll walk you through it. So down at the bottom of the screen, just follow my directions, there's the icon for Acrobat Professional. She's going to click on that to make it active, Acrobat Professional. And um, then she's going to go up to File. And she's going to go to Create. And she's, no, hang on a sec. Slow it down. You're way too fast for me. Go to Combine Files into a Single PDF. And then a screen comes up, and now what she does is she's going to add all her files. She's super organized, so it won't be hard. She clicks on Add Files, correct, and then go to Add Files, right at the top, the first one, right? And it's going to take you to a navigation folder. And you're on the desktop, and you made that nice, organized Chapter 2 Artwork and Resources folder, so click on that. Double click. Okay. And because she's so organized, she can... Don't double click. Click on one and hold the shift key down all the way for the rest. No, no, no. Click on one. Hold the shift key on the keyboard. And you see one? Yeah. Click. No, no. Don't move. Click and drag. Will it let you do that? Maybe Can not. You can just drag the files from the folder. No, I understand. Um, let's view it like that. So if you click, hold the shift key down and go to the bottom one, okay. it's going to select them all. Okay. And now click on Add Files, and it's going to add them all into here. Okay. Now she clicks on Combine Files. It's going to make a folder called Binder, or a PDF file called Binder. And what I want her to do is go to File, <clears throat> up there, File, and you need to save as, and now name it, Chapter 202, and your name. Get rid of the binder part. We don't want the binder part. Yep, 02, and then put your name. Right, and then put something so you know it's your combination of files. So you might want to call it composite or get a naming that works for you, but since you've named everything based on the assignment, which is super organized and wonderful, it's the only one you have that's named like that, so you know that's going to be your combination file to turn in. And you've saved it again in your Artwork and Resources folder, which is perfect, and you click Save. Right, it's wonderful. And, um, oh, I don't know what the computer is doing now. Just skip that. Okay. And then let's launch Safari for you because I want you to practice uploading. Why does, when you combine the files, why, why does the score sheet come 
up and it doesn't have your scores that you I don't know. You know what? I don't know why the form, like if you filled it out and then it doesn't show me. Yeah. Usually what happens is, is if I roll over it, um, so log into Moodle, do you know? Log into your mm -hmm. Moodle because I want you to upload it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I this is your... I my computer. You already uploaded no. it? No, I mean I was already in your microphone. It, it won't matter. So. It'll let you do it. Um, so why did the form sh not show up? I don't know. It's just random and weird. Okay. might have been that I created the form wrong when I created the forms or something like that. Okay. Some people it doesn't show, some people it does show. So you don't have to fill it out again? You don't have to I fill it out again. It will show up if you saved it. So right now Laura's just logging into her Moodle. Is there anything you don't want people to see? <laughs> no. No, okay. <laughs> any, any hidden secrets in your Moodle? <laughs> okay, so now go to the assignment link. You could go right there. Perfect. And go to chapter two, right? Scroll, go to choose file, and um, locate on the desktop is where we put everything. So just click desktop, that'll get you there. Chapter, artwork and resources folder, and then the one that you just named at the top, right? That one, because that's your combination of files. And actually, um, put your cursor over this right here. Click through that. See the little arrows in Acrobat Professional? Look, keep clicking. All of her assignments, she can just make sure they're all there that way, too. Isn't that kind of neato? Um, beautiful. And choose your file. Now you got to click on Upload This File. And then you need to wait. You all need to be really patient, because sometimes it takes a really long time to upload. And sometimes Moodle's weird and doesn't do it. Now she sees that she's got it in the left side with an X next to it, which means it's been successfully uploaded. One student uploaded their file and it didn't have an X next to it, but it showed, the name showed over there, so it was successfully uploaded. And and you're done. That's it. Wasn't that painful, right? No. It's, Want to do the other one by yourself without yeah. me narrating? But you got to talk into the computer because this is being recorded. So as you do it, just go ahead, keep going. Um, what, Alberto? Yeah, and you can add notes to me. So scroll down. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back over to, yeah, scroll down a little. Yeah, go to edit. And you could write a nice note like, thanks, Vicki. This whole class is watching me. I can't believe I have to write you a note, right? Right, so that's it. That's all you need to do. But Alberto just wanted to call attention to it. Okay. That's good enough. And then you'd scroll down, scroll down, and you'd click Save Changes. And then always when you do anything, make sure your file's still there. Weird random things happen in Moodle that I can't explain. Okay? And then if you click back to Assignments, um, now you go to Chapter 3. <coughs> You can have that window active for your next set of PDFs when you make them. Okay. So okay. Just file. Well, you haven't made your combination yeah, yet. Yeah, I have done it on the chapter three as well. You combined them? Yeah. No, not yet. Let's check. Okay. Click on it. So you have them separate. You don't do that here. Okay. Hit cancel. Go back to Acrobat Professional. Down at the bottom. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Perfect. Close that. You don't need that anymore. Okay, do you want me to talk you through it one more time? Okay, go to File, go to Create. Oops, I did it again. I know, it's okay. When you work with a new mouse, it's awkward. Combine files into a single PDF. Go to Add Files, Add Files, yeah. And then go to Artwork and Resources, and then click on that top one. Hold your Shift key down. <coughs> And don't drag, just click to the bottom. Perfect. Add your files. They'll all load. You can change the sequence and put your score sheet first, which okay. is that. Okay, take one? your score sheet and use the up arrow and it'll move it for you. See? Mm -hmm. And now you can combine all your files. And then it's going to say binder. So you're going to want to go file, save as, file, S save as, yes. And now put your name on it, and it's chapter three. So, 03 and your name. Any questions about this while she's doing it? Is this helpful to review for some of you? If you do it, if you have a Macintosh and you do it in preview, it won't work. 
Preview's the default kind of equivalent to Reader, and um, it doesn't work the same as Acrobat Professional. So, so yeah, close Alberto, them. close that. You don't need it. You can close that. You don't need it. Yes, Alberto. So do you put the name on it? Yes, and she probably had her name on it. You're in chapter three, and then you want your final combo one. Is that up at the top? Mm -hmm. And you can click through to make sure it's got everything you want there. Yeah? yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes it, that's what Susan was asking, and then upload. That's what Susan was asking. How come um, it doesn't show? Sometimes it doesn't. And then, any other questions, Susan? Um, just in terms of organiz organizing your files on your, uh, most people, I guess, will do it on their desktop. Is that correct? No. So where do you where do you keep all your files? How do I keep my files organized? Yes. Um, where do you? What do I personally do? I have some a computer called a RAID. Good morning. I have a computer called a RAID, which is I have a hard drive, and then I have two other drives which mirror one another. So if one drive dies, the mirror should have everything I need. And um, that's just based on the amount of work I do. So I keep all my applications on my hard drive. And I don't mess with it. Like I don't put iTunes on it. I don't put movies on it. I kind of keep it like this little application sanctuary. And then I have a folder, which is actually my two drives. I call them work, which means it's all my working files. And I organize them by client. So you might organize it by class. So you might, for example, on your computer have something um, called <coughs> fun. And you might have something called photos. And you might have something called movies and music. And then you might have a folder that says Santa Barbara City College. And then a subfolder that says graphic design basics. And then a subfolder in there that organizes by chapter. Can you put it in documents? Or? Um, well, you have, I don't, you can make a folder. You can make a new folder. Do you have a Mac or a PC? A okay, you might want to make a new folder called Santa Barbara City College. And you can make an alias. Let me show you. Thank you. Are you good? Yeah. Thank nice you work. Very much. Yeah, Thank good you. job. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to log you out, Laura. All right, so just to show you, so. You're, what I hear you asking me is, how do you get organized? And on the computers at school, um, you, you, know, you have something on the left side called documents. On the computer at school, I can make a new folder. Go to File, New Folder. And notice down here on the bottom right, it says Untitled. And I can call it SBCC. See that? And there's something called. Um, make alias, which will link me to that folder. And I can put that right here, right under your documents folder on your computer. And every time you access this, it's going to take you to that folder called SBCC, if you want. <laughs> and that's how you can get organized so you can find it easily. You can put all your school stuff in there, sure. All my school stuff, so right. It's not all of right. So if right now, I can take um, everything and put it into this folder. That was Laura's on my desktop. So I've cleaned off my desktop. And it's unlimited how big it can be. Well, it's unlimited until you run out of room on your computer. Right. Yeah. It's unlimited until you don't have any more room. <laughs> okay. Any other random questions? Otherwise, I think I will take on um, chapter four for all of you. Does that work? OK. All right, then let's do that. And then um, I'll be sure to give you some work time today. Um, let's go back to Moodle for me. Let's go take a look at chapter four and see what my instructions are to you. My instructions are read the chapter, um, do everything you possibly can in the chapter, complete all the chapter assignments in four, refer to the handout, and you will submit for grading everything if you do everything, because I look at it all. But the ones I will be grading is 4B like boy and 4D like dog. 
And um, so I'm going to see if I've in if I have Chapter Four downloaded in my work folder here. So I'll go to here. See if I have Chapter Four anywhere. Here's Chapter Four. And Four B. Um, I really like this this one. So, and let's see if I have my student handout for it. And I don't think I do. So I think I need to download the student handout. So if you would like, this is a really fun assignment. Um, beautiful morning. And 4D is a really fun assignment. So I think for your, um, for your morning pleasure, why don't you all um, download the artwork and resources folder for chapter four, and we'll do them together as a class so you guys can make some progress. Yeah? Does that work for all of you? Yes. If I go kind of fast, um, I'm probably not going to slow it down. You know there'll be a video for you to follow, but that way um, at least you'll feel like you're making a dent in it. So I'm going to pause this for the moment. Okay, so right now we're working on Chapter 4 assignment. What's the number? 4B, like boy, called Beautiful Morning. And we're not going to work from the template. We're going to create our own document. Um, what size is the document that they created over there? Can you see? If you go to File Setup, I'm just curious. I don't think I've actually ever looked. File d Document Setup. File Document Setup. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. What does it say? 8 by 10. 8 by 10. Okay. That's usually my first problem when I do this assignment is I, is I don't use their um, setup. Okay. So let me open... Uh, let me open the student handout, and let's just look at the pages together. Oh, let me talk about this assignment first. This is 4A, and this is XY coordinates. And take a look up here. You're not going to really want to miss this. I'm not going to demo this for assignment work, but I do want you to do this in your book, and it has value. Um, it has actually really important value to you. So if you're facing your computer, Please turn this direction. All right. Um, XY coordinates are really important in InDesign because it tells you the placement of the graphics that you're creating or the text. And you might think it doesn't matter that you just eyeball where you want to position things on a page, but that as a designer, that's not necessarily the case. Oftentimes, you're going to have very specific parameters. Um, you're going to have very specific parameters for a document you create. So, for example, you might do a direct mail piece for a client, and then it's going to get folded up, and the address has to go exactly here, and it's going to have to show through a window envelope. Everybody understands what I just described, right? So, that's where it's critical to know the measurement of the placement for, one, the size of your document, where you wish to put your folds, and where you might put this little window for the address to show through. And that's why understanding XY coordinates and how to manipulate them are important. So if I, if I enlarge this right here, you're going to look and say, what the heck are they talking about? And they're showing you something here that we haven't addressed yet, which is in InDesign, if I open my software right now, in InDesign in the upper left corner, where I'm circling, um, that's called a reference point. So it means that when you create a new document, I'll just make a default 8.5 by 11 document. When you create a new document and I draw a text box, my reference, my reference point says the XY coordinates measure from the top left corner of whatever box I've drawn. So right now, I probably have a half inch margin, right? That's my default. So if I draw a box like this, you'll notice in our formatting control panel, it tells you the box is almost five inches and almost, almost four and a half inches high. It also tells you that the box sits at the, FY, at the XY coordinate of a half inch. Everybody can see that, correct? So that's kind of a, that's a no-brainer. Okay, if I, if I have my document right here and I pulled 
a guideline over. Can you see the little gray box that shows the guideline? If I pulled a guideline over, it says my x coordinate's at a half inch there. If I pulled the guideline here, my x coordinate is at a half inch, um, and my y coordinate's a half inch down. The bottom of the box, the y coordinate is at 4.88. And let's see. And the far right hand side of the box, my x coordinate is located on that page, the reference point for it as, is at 5.47 inches. So if you look at this assignment here in the PDF file, I can, um, <coughs> I can even draw a guideline here and the reference is showing you, here's the corner of my document, don't do it on your InDesign document, do it based on the document they've displayed for you. And if you pull the guide here, it shows you that your vertical um, coordinate, which I forget is the X or the Y, the vertical, let's see, this is how I have to do it because I forget. It's Y. Thank you. You see you guys are so on top of it. Okay, vertical, vertical guideline is X. Yeah. That's how come I check. <laughs> so my X coordinate is my vertical. Okay? So if I go back to my InDesign document, my vertical coordinate shows you right here, um, what did I say, X is at one inch, and my Y is at a half an inch, all right? Now, if I scroll over here, I'm gonna pull a guide over here again, and now it tells me I'm, I'm measuring my reference point not from the upper left corner, but from the middle, see this little symbol here? Measure it from the middle of the shape and the far left side. So if I pull it over the far left side, what do we say that was an X coordinate is still at a one inch, but my Y coordinate right here, the middle, the middle of this is where that little blue dot is in the document. It's at the one and a half inch mark. Y'all follow that? Okay, thanks for nodding, that's good. All right, then you get into weird stuff like this. So this one, well let's look at this one. Let me let me hit undo undo on this document. I won't undo my guidelines. All right. Um, this one is on the right side middle. But when you get into a shape like this one right here, the bottom left, you look and you say, well that's a triangle. It doesn't have my whole square, right? Confusing. All right, this is what you do. Now what do we say? The vertical is X. X. Is that what we said? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll just come back and double check. Our vertical coordinates are X. All right. What's that? It's actually, it's actually the horizontal one, but because you're you're the measuring on line. the horizontal scale. Oh, I'm measuring on the horizontal. It, yeah, I have them flipped. Doing it with a All right. Line. That's why it's confusing. All right. There we go. <laughs> Well, let's um, just check your book for X, Y being the vertical or horizontal. But um, when you have something like a triangle, we're measuring the bottom left corner, but our bottom left corner of this shape isn't displayed. So what you would do is you would take your coordinate over to the far left side of the triangle, which is the three inch mark, right? And you take your bottom coordinate here of the triangle, which is your two and a half inch mark. So what you're saying is it's at three inches by two and a half inches. So even though it's not there, that is what would be considered the bounding box. Because if I'm in InDesign and I create a shape, if I go to the polygon tool right here, and I hold my option key down and I click, I can choose how many sides to my polygon. And a triangle would have three. And I say, okay, so there's my, what did I do? Did I not have three? Oh, I made it three inches. I have three sides. And here's my triangle. And if I fill my triangle with green, you'll still see that the bounding box that defines my XY coordinates of my triangle is this rectangle here. Does that make sense for everybody? Are there questions about it? You're all so quiet. Not a question? All right. Um, so you get into something stranger at the very bottom one,
like these shapes. And as you can see, they still have bounding boxes. So you come up with what the bounding box is, and you're looking at the reference point for um, what you're measuring from, the center or not. And how you change your reference point when you're in InDesign is simple. You just, here's now the center measurement, the bottom right corner. I'm in the upper left corner <coughs> of the document, right? Everybody understand? Okay. All right. So that's the, that's the um, XY coordinate assignment. And I do recommend that you get familiar with it. The next assignment we're going to do is called Beautiful Morning. And yes, they do provide a document for you. I forgot your name. I'm so sorry. Julia. And Julia, check the document that it was 8 inches wide by 10 inches tall. Um, and if we go to the Artwork and Resources folder, I just want to show you this. And we go to the Chapter 4 folder. They give you a template. And they give you colors, and they give you places to put the teacups, and they give you the dotted line. Because if I go to the bottom right corner of the toolbox, you'll see it's all done for you. But where's the fun in that? Right? There's no fun in that. So what I'd like to do with you, you're welcome to use this template, but what I instead would like to do, because I think it'll make you a more powerful InDesign user, is I'd like to intuit with you how this document's set up. All right? And when you set up your document, you can make a little note to me and to John that you did it by starting from scratch and not with a template, because um, you're essentially eyeballing it with me. And let's also look at this document. Um, let's look at it like this. So we're looking at a rectangle. We know it's 8 by 10. The furthest back element, because we don't see this dotted line here, is a rectangle with dotted lines. Dotted lines are brown. The good part about, oh, I'll teach you something new that you will like, though, about this template. Let me just go back to the template. Open recent. One of the benefits of this template is they give you the swatches to use for this brown, but we're going to make our own swatch, which is another thing I was going to point out. So the background is, of the furthest back element is a box that has dots, and it's stroked. Then the next thing is another box sitting on top of it that overlaps it and hangs to the left is um, a tan box. I can choose to put my type in it or not. And then equidistant from one another are four identical boxes with teacups in them. And equidistant between them is the little glyph, the little flower glyph. All right? And then we observe the type and what the type is. Now, do pay attention to the type. Do meet the type criteria as precisely. Your goal, again, again, is to make this as perfect a match as possible, but we're going to build it together. So um, we'll set this to the side, and um, we'll also notice down here in our PDF file, it tells us exactly what type to use and how to do it. So um, let's create a new and design document. Um, yeah, Charlotte. I, I set my preferences to inches, but still it, sh it let me show this. It shows PICAs? Yeah. Okay, so close your document. Like the whole I'm sorry? Don't quit in design. Just close yeah. your document. Yeah. Um, so start by going to close a document. Start before you open a document to InDesign preferences, units and increments. Yeah. Oh. Uh, use pull down to inches and I pull swear down. I inches yeah. Well, what happens is if you do it when a document is open yeah. and then you close that old document it defaults back to what the default is. In order to override the default, you have to do it without a document open. It would only apply it to that document. Okay? Yep. All righty. So um, make a new document, file new, and turn off facing pages. We don't need a bleed on this document, so we're going to make our document 8 inches wide by 10 inches tall. And actually, you know what? S stop a second. Um, stay right here and I'm going to go back to this PDF file and let's look at our document here for our, our use. And if you look up at the screen right here, let's figure out how to make this work strongly for us. So everybody look up here for a second. 
Notice that we probably have a half inch margin here, a half inch margin here, but this probably isn't a half inch. This is probably one and a half inches, maybe. Two and a quarter. What is it? Two and a quarter. There you go. You see it right up there. It's two and a quarter. So this left side is a two and a quarter guide. This one here, is it two and a quarter? No. It's two. It's two. It's two, Alberto, because that's a little off. But, and this is maybe, here's a half inch. We'll say that's about a half inch. So I could right now set my guidelines differently than what the default is, just to help myself. Okay, so back to my InDesign setup. I'm going to uncheck, unclick the chain link here for margins. Leave it a half inch all around, except for the left side, which is going to be two and a half inches. Right? I mean, two inches. Thank you. Two inches. And now I have a document that looks like that. So the first thing I do when I start something, so I make my life easy and I don't lose things if they crash, is I go to File, Save, As. I haven't done anything except set it up. And I'm going to call this O4B underscore Torf in design, and I'm going to put it in the 4B folder for beautiful morning, okay, and save it. Done. You going to do it with us or no? You like watching? Well, uh, I, yeah, I just need to get there. <laughs> okay, okay, well then just watch, it's all good. All right, so now I've set up my document, and the first thing I can do, I think the first thing I want to do is mix a brown color. So I'm going to double click on any swatch, or I can use this pull-out menu in my swatch panel called New Color Swatch. And I can move my slider bars around until I find brown. Some brown that I like. That's a brown I like. That looks like good coffee brown. It's changing to inches? Did you, it didn't change to inches? Okay. I'm having a trouble getting these pipe Okay, let me do this again for you guys. You guys seem to have trouble with pipe Everybody close your documents. Close your windows. If you're having inches trouble, close your document. So with your document closed, so I've saved this. I'm going to save it and close it with no document open. I think you guys who are using templates, you're having to suffer the default template measurements. So let's make a new document, but before you make a new document, go to InDesign, Preferences, with the documents closed, Units and Increments, and select Inches right here. Should you do that, Mark? Go to InDesign, Preferences, Who uses PC? Do you want to change the oh, like units and increments on the PC? Yes, yeah, because it's 
It's not the same. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's called Fountain. Uh, that's the thing. I tried Google it. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's so I'm just confused. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. So, did you get yours figured out already? All right, so I'm coming back to this now. I should have paused this video. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back right now to open recent, and here's my document. So I've. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I created a brown swatch, yes? So I'm going to swap and my fill and change it to a stroke because my brown is active. So right now I have my brown color in the stroke mode. Yes, sir. You bet. So you can go to window, swatches to, I mean, window color, swatches to open the swatch panel. Okay. And then you can, there's a little pullout on the top right corner of the swatch panel, new color swatch. And you get a choice of all these different values of color. Does yours say CMYK? Yes. Okay, that's what you want. And then you just mix your sliders around. Renato, just back and forth, changes your colors. Each slider moves. Click and slide. And you can make your swatches. All right? Slide your black down from 100% down to, like, none. You see your black sliders at 100%? Oh, okay. Does that help you? Okay, so I'm going to move more quickly, otherwise we'll never get done, right? <laughs> and then you can watch the video if we haven't done this. So, um, okay, so I got a brown swatch right now. Now I'm going to go to my um, shape tool, go to a rectangle tool, go right on my guides, click and drag a rectangle. It's stroked brown. I'm going to go to the top where my formatting control is. I'm going to create Japanese dots, I think. I'm not yeah. sure. Is it Japanese? Okay. And I'm going to increase them till they it's kind four. I'm sorry? I think it's four. Oh, it tells you what point size? No. But I looked at it. <laughs> oh, did you do it? You did that measurement yeah. thing. You did that thing you do, right? That perfectionist thing you do. All right, now, well. Thankfully. We're glad you're here. That's good for us. Okay. So, okay, we picked four point dots because Charlotte thinks that's the right thing. And they're brown, and we can make them either, I think we decided they were Japanese dots. I don't know what the difference between a Japanese dot and a dotted is, but. There's more space between. Yeah. <laughs> but why they call them a Japanese dot is beyond me. I have no idea. And then again, save your document because you've done something. Okay, the next thing we do is we look at our screen again and we say, okay, now the next thing that's there is this tinted box. And the tinted brown box is maybe a half inch from the right side of the dots, maybe a vertical inch from the top, a vertical inch from the bottom, and it hangs beyond 
it hangs beyond our dots by, let's say, an inch. So if I go to my document here, I just said, I'm going to pull a guideline. It's about a half inch in, it's about a half, an inch down, it's about an inch up, roughly. Right? So what I said? And I could be wrong. I'm eyeballing it. And I said it's about an inch in. Right? And we'll see if it looks okay. And then what I'm going to do is take this rectangle from my guideline to guideline to guideline. Right? Like that. I'm going to turn off the stroke, apply none. I'm going to make the fill active and I'm going to go to my swatch panel with my fill active and I'm going to select my brown and I'm going to make it let's say a 20 percent in the tint box up at the top right there. And then again I'm going to save my document because I've done something. Command S is to save it. Right? And I'm starting to build it. Now, the next thing I notice is that about a half inch down, my teacup starts. And about an inch out, aligned with that brown box, my teacup starts. So what that means to me is if I drag a guideline down right here to the half inch mark, there's my teacup where it starts at that coordinate. And if I look at the bottom here, it's about a half inch up from my dotted line here, so I'm going to create another guideline for myself. And the reason I create guidelines is because things snap to guides, and I think it helps you. All right. So what I'm going to do is go to my black arrow. I'm going to go to File, Place. I'm going to locate my Artwork and Resources folder for Chapter 4B. I'm going to locate the Photoshop document that's blue that says PS, PSD for Photoshop document. I'm going to click on it and my cursor is going to automatically load with the graphic. And I click open. Now my cursor is going to load with the teacup graphic and because I gave myself a guideline a half inch above that brown and aligned with the brown, don't click and drag because they've given you this teacup at 100% size, I think. So I click and the teacup places in my document. And I again, I go to File, Save. Everybody doing okay? Am I going too fast? Yeah. It's okay, there's a video. Oh. How do you change the tint? You will get to watch the video. Okay. All right, I'm going to click on the brown box, Alberto. I'm going to go to swatches with my brown box, and in the upper right corner it says tint. Make it 20%. All right? Any other questions while I'm paused here for a moment? Don't jump ahead of me, okay? Right. Yeah, right. Okay, Susan says. You doing okay back there? Nick? You with me? Is that Nick? With a, who's that? Tim, you doing okay? Yeah. All righty. All right, so here we go. Now, let's look at this thing, this artwork here. Notice that there is a teacup down at the bottom, again, about a half inch up, and I put a guideline there. If I go to my black arrow, my selection tool, and I click on the teacup, and I hold my option key down, and my shift key down, I get a double arrow. That means it's going to duplicate it, and because I've pressed my shift key down, it's not going to wiggle out of alignment. And I can drag it down to the guide there, and I have duplicated my teacup. And then, randomly, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hold my option key, my shift key, and I'm going to move one here, and I'm going to hold my option key and shift key there. Because we have four teacups, I want to put four teacups on my page. What I want to be sure to do is have my top teacup in the place I want and the bottom teacup in the place I want. Okay? Am I doing Diego? Is it good? Yeah. You just following me? You just watching? Um, 
Okay. And now here's the fun part that I don't think they tell you to do in the book. And I think this is super fun. I use this all the time. If you go to Window and you go to Object Layout and you locate a line, you'll find a panel that will open up for you. Make that panel open. This is the Align panel. The Align panel in the pullout has options. Look, Show Options, Hide Options. Make sure you Show Options. Always show options on a panel when you can. And now, I want to equally space out my teacups, but I don't want to have to eyeball them because I want to make sure I'm precise. So I can click on a teacup, hold my shift key down, I'm in the black arrow, click on a teacup, the third teacup, the fourth teacup. My shift key, I'm holding my shift key down. And now I go down here to distribute vertical spacing. And just look, even if you're not doing this with me, because it's just cool, I click on it and they vertically distribute their spacing so they're equidistant from one another. Okay? And again, I'm going to go to File, Save, and save my document. So now if you look, they gave you both basically all of this with the document template. Um, they just wanted you to place the graphic in the box they gave you, but we just created our own. Okay? And I've saved it. Now you notice these little glyphs are smack in between each of the teacups. And the easiest way to pull that off is go to your type tool, and it's going to, again, snap to guides. Click and drag a type box that's the width and height of the space in between your teacups. And because it's in between them, um, it's going to snap to all of the borders and boundaries of those boxes. And here I'm going to refer down and find out what my little flower looks like. And it's going to tell me. Let's see. Add a glyph. Text frame's been created between each photo. <coughs> the glyph on the example is from Minion Pro Regular 18 point. So if I come back here, Minion Pro Regular 18 point, I hit a return. Now I've got my point size ready to go. And I can go to type glyphs and a panel is going to open because I don't know what the letter will be for a flower. And I'm going to open my glyphs panel, tear it off, and open it super wide and scroll down till I see flowers. Now I see flowers. And what flower did it use? This flower, right? And I'm going to double click and it pops into my text box because my text box is active with my type tool, right? And then I look, so now I've picked my glyph. And if I go back to my sample up here, my glyph is vertically centered and horizontally centered, which means in here with my text, my type tool active, I'm going to go to my paragraph panel and center it in the text box. And I'm going to go to object, text frame options, which you learned in the previous chapter and I want to I'm going to turn on previous so you can see this I want to vertically align it so it's centered in the box and look what happens right and now it's vertically centered in my box now because I've done that successfully now because I've done that successfully I'm going to duplicate my text box here so again, you already know how to do this. I make my text box active. I'm in my um, selection tool, the black arrow. The text box is active. I hold my option key down and my shift key, which is going to duplicate my text box. And it's snapped into that little place. You saw it kind of snap in there. I'm going to hold my option key and my shift key and drag it down. And I've duplicated it again. And now I'm successful, so I'm going to save it. And if you want to look what it looks like in preview, you go to the bottom of the toolbox to preview. And here we go. Right? 
You can see I'm pretty good except for my type. Um, yes, um, Julia. I always do like command C, command D, like copy That's fine. That's okay. However you get there is fine. Okay. I like mine because um, I can align it and I, um, it, if you hit command V, which is paste, it's going to put it wherever the heck it wants. Yeah. It won't and it, it, it will put it on the page when you paste it wherever you want, and then when you move it, it oh, will okay. snap. So another, another, it's another step. step. Right. All right? Everybody's good? Everybody's good. All right. So save your document, and then let's just assess what we got going on over here. So now all we really have is all this text. Now the super cool thing about InDesign is um, there's two ways to handle this text. One is, um, I think I mentioned the other day, is you don't need to retype the text because usually the PDF files will let you copy the text. But if you notice in um, the Artwork and Resources folder right here for Beautiful Morning, there is a text document for you. So InDesign will allow you to place Word document text. So without anything active, make sure no text, no images are active, click off of everything so nothing's active. You go to File Place and you locate in the Beautiful Morning folder the text document. And now my cursor is not going to load with a graphic, it's going to load with text. So I click open, my cursor loads with text, right like that. If you look at the screen, you'll see it. But what you want to look at here is again, assess for yourself where the text box is going to sit. The text box um, is about a half inch from the teacups and maybe a half inch to three quarters of an inch from the right of the document. <coughs> And it's not quite vertically centered. It actually sits starting at the baseline of the teacup, interestingly enough. All right? So what I suggest you do is this. What I would do is I would find about the half inch mark. And I'm not going to worry about placing my text box height yet because you don't know your type size and how it's all going to play out. So I'm just going to click and drag and make a text box about a half inch from the left, I mean about a half inch from the right of the teacups. And again, save your document. And then I'm going to scroll down here and I want you to learn how to do, um, I want you to learn how to do something different than they specify here, which is going to save your life um, in future documents. Okay? So, our first line of type is Myriad Pro Condensed, 32 on 27. So let's go to Beautiful Morning. We'll triple click on it. It's Myriad Pro Condensed. So I'm going to type Myriad Pro, select Condensed, 32 point size, double click on it, double click on Letting, triple click on Letting and make it 27 points, and now I have Beautiful Morning set up properly. And I'm going to save my document, Command-S. And now, the next line is Adobe Caslon Pro Italic 22 on 26. Okay. D triple click on it, go to type up here in the character panel, Adobe Pro, Caslon Pro, and we select italic, and it was, what was it? 22 on 26. Are you guys having fun yet? Yes. Yes. Nice. All right. Good. We like that. All right. <coughs> Looks like more spacing to me, doesn't it? Oh, I see. The letting's wrong. I typed it wrong. That's why it looked like more spacing. So it's 26, not 36. There we go. Better. Now, pay attention here. This you'll get nailed for big time. See the T right here and see the G here? 
in comparison to these. That's because this T right here, if I highlight it, click and drag and highlight it, it is called a swash, open type swash. And how you locate open type swash for me, the easiest way to do it is there's a pullout at the end of the formatting control panel. If you're in characters, you go to open type, locate swash, and that's where you find the T. The other way you can do it is this. I can go to the G in garden. It's the same, it's a different way to do it. And I think I can open the glyphs panel. And if I open the glyphs panel, I will be able to see the swash and I can double click on it and it should have applied it. <coughs> see? Oh, says Susan, that's really fun. <laughs> I like watching your face, it's fun. Okay, so there you go. And then it says do space after of 0.3125. Alrighty, I can do that. So triple click Tea Room and Gardens. Go to um, the paragraph, no, yes, paragraph panel. Go to the space after control. And it said 0.3125. Save your document, Command S. Now, what it tells you to do is to draw a rule and a rule below. So let me show you how to do that. With the tea room and gardens highlighted, Um, let me move this over a little. With Tea Room and Gardens highlighted, it wants a half point rule. It wants it the width of the text and it wants it offset at 0.125. So keep your eyes here. So what you do is you, this is considered a paragraph because if I go to show hidden characters right now and I go to preview mode, that's a paragraph ending. So it's going to apply a rule, what I'm doing now, it's going to apply a rule to that paragraph, which happens to be only one line. And I go to type, let's see, and I want to open my paragraph panel right here, and I want to use the pullout menu in the upper right corner and I want to go down to paragraph rules. And I rarely do it because I think this is cumbersome, so I use the shortcut key, which is Shift and Command and J. J for rules. Go explain that one. Okay, a rule is the same thing as a stroke or a line. They call it a rule. So I open the rules panel, and this is what I get. My text is active. I want a rule below. I want to turn on my rule. Mm -hmm. I want to make it. Um, I want to make it a half a point in weight. I want to make it as wide as my text, not the column width. And I wish to. Let's click on preview so you can see what I built. See, it's right there. And I wish to offset it um, an eighth of an inch. So how you offset it is right here. Here's an eighth of an inch, and see the rule move down below the G? Does everybody see that? I'll leave that on the screen for a second so you can make sure and get it all accurate. We're good? Okay, and then I say okay. And now I come back here and I look at most of the text is set up as Adobe Caslon Pro. 14 point type on 20. Space after each paragraph is 0.1875. And it's flush left, ragged right. So, what I'm going to do is just take all the rest of this text, even the bottom line, which is going to have to get changed later. And I'm just going to change all of it to um, Adobe Caslon Pro. And I'm going to make it. Um, and it's regular, and it's 14 point <coughs> on 20 point letting. And I go to my paragraph panel, and I add space after my paragraphs of 0.1875, and it's flush left, ragged right. Now, 
There's one thing here that you're going to have to become familiar with, which is also important, which is on this pullout right here, which is called Balance Ragged Lines. That's in the Paragraph Panel. I can also use this Paragraph Panel, use the pullout here, and go to Balance Ragged Lines. And look what happens to my line lengths when I balance my ragged lines. This is important. Everybody looking up? Balance ragged lines, watch what happens to the line length. It evens them all out. Now, this is an invitation. Look at my screen. I have random hyphens. I have a hyphen for a street name. I have a hyphen for a selection. I think invitations should never have hyphenation in words. So I have a choice. I can go back up here to my paragraph panel and turn off hyphenation which is probably the easiest way to eliminate it for starters. And now it looks much cleaner. Okay? So I go back and I save my document. The next thing I do is I look and I read the text and I decide where I want to break my lines and what I think is good design. And to tell you the truth, this invitation right here on the right I think is poor design and I'll tell you why because they started celebrate here when this naturally breaks after the word space. So they have a narrower text box width here and I think it's because this is about uh, three quarters of an inch in. So they narrow their text box width here. But one of the things I would correct is this. Dessert, if I zoom in here, I go to the bottom of my toolbox, go to my zoom tool, and notice dessert here. This hyphen should not be a hyphen. It tells you on your assignment page, on your handout, that it's an M dash. So if you don't remember the shortcut key for it, highlight your hyphen, go to type, go to special character, go to dashes, hyphens and dashes select an M dash and see how it got wider. Now it shows you the M dash without spacing on each side of it which I think is ugly, unattractive. So I add a letter space on each side of my M dashes because I think it's more attractive. I used the uh, M dash on uh, one, of the, one of the projects yesterday and it didn't put the dash, it put the space. Yes, because it, you were supposed to do exactly that. It asked you to make a white M dash, That's a white space M dash. Space. Yes, it was, so you did it accurately. This is a real M dash that you can see. So yesterday's was perfect for you. Today's, this is what you do. They're different. OK, the other thing is, is when you read your text here, find us at the corner of Haverdale and Evanson Avenue. I think that doesn't break properly. So there's something called a soft return. Have you learned that in your books yet? OK, so a soft return is where you hit a shift return, which breaks a line but doesn't break a paragraph. So I'm going to put my cursor in front of Haverdale and hit a shift return, which is a soft return and break my line. And then personally, I would break um, my line after the word in because I think that's a more appropriate way to break my line in the heart of downtown Houston. That works okay for me, being that wide. Um, because I think it reads more clearly than their invitation did. That's my opinion. The other thing that we didn't do here is this says, make a raised cap on the first paragraph. And making a raised cap really should just be as simple as this. If I were you, I'd highlight the letter O. I'd go to your character panel, and i just make it taller until you think it looks appropriate. So I made mine 24 point. The other thing I would do is I would select all your text, put your cursor anywhere, and go to Edit, Select All. Good morning. Good morning. And I would go to your kerning panel and change metric kerning to optical, because it will make it more attractive. And again, save your document, Command-S. And then lastly for this assignment, we have to fix what I did wrong at the bottom. 
which is open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. bullet point Tuesday N dash Sunday soft return reservations etc. And that's Myriad Pro Condensed 15 on 17. So I'm going to highlight all of this, <coughs> change the font to Myriad Pro Condensed 15 point on 17 and what else do I have to do? Space before it says right here. Space before is an eighth of an inch. There is no space after on this so eliminate it in case it's in place and then go back to where it says Sunday and get rid of the paragraph return and hit a shift return forward delete and then go to where that hyphen is highlight it and go to type insert special character hyphen dash and dash and we should look pretty good let's go back up and look at ourselves here so I'm going to save my document again. Let's get rid of my guide so we can look at it. So the difference is between the document in the PDF file and mine is where they position their text box. They started their text box at the base of the teacup. So I'm going to just make my text box active and move it down to the bottom of the teacup by moving it with my arrow. And then I'm going to look at it and see if I'm pretty close. My, my brown box is deeper than their brown box. And I think, and my type doesn't come as low, John. Um, everybody's creating these from scratch instead of using the template. So they may vary a little bit. Is there a template for that? There is. So um, they're going to write the you a note. Brain site, yeah, there's a template. So they're going to write you a note that says, I eyeball this whole thing with Vicky. That's all I do when I grade them is eyeball them. Okay. Just so you know. Unless there's a specified size. Right. Just so you know. And you're going to write John that note because if you're a hair off, it's okay if it looks beautiful. All right? It doesn't have to be right. It just has to look right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, again. How do you do that keyboard shortcut where you um, adjusted the size of the text box? Oh, oh, you were watching me. I quietly did that, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Um, Gan asked me, my text box was just hanging out. And because I'm a perfectionist, I just kind of tidy things up. So the, the shortcut for that is object fitting, fit the frame to the content right there, yeah. which is a command and a uh, shift and a C and it tightens it up to the bottom. And it doesn't impact anything whatsoever except make, make me sleep well at night. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't change how things print. It's not going to show up. And then if I view this, how do you think I did? Do you think that's pretty swell? Alberto, what would you give me? A W. A W? Yeah. What's a W? Well, you mean pick off the one or small. So oh, it means go to preview. Oh, go to preview? On this one, you want to see it with a W? It's going to close my window. Oh, well, the rulers won't show in the document. But do you think I did a good job? Yeah. You sure? Would you, would you fix anything? What's that? What would you fix? Come show me. What would you do? I would make a frame around here, like a different. An outline? Yeah, and then the glitter will change colors and one we'll flip the other way. The other way. Oh, <laughs> you are an artist. Okay, okay. I'll show you what. Yeah, but John will probably nail you if you do it backwards. But I'll show you. So, so leave it like this. But Alberto, the artist, said to do this. 
Alberto the artist said, take my glyph and go to my object panel. And he said, flip it. Because he thinks it's, it's cuter if they go back and forth, right? Is that what you told me? Yeah, change color. And change the colors of them. OK, I'm going to make mine white. But don't do this. <laughs> OK? Don't do this because, oh, I stroked it. We don't want to stroke it. Never stroke type. Never, 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 never. Don't do this because John will say, what were you thinking? Yes, John. Clients are the worst obstacle to good design. They specify something that you don't think is good enough. You still have to do it other way. You sometimes do. Usually what you say is, that's a fabulous idea. Let me show you other options. <laughs> OK. So save your document. I'm going to pause this. OK. If you created this document from scratch, and let's say you wish to insert the XY coordinate assignment with it, you can do this. You can go to the page panel, and you can drag in front of this one another page. So I've added a page. And remember, this page is 8 by 10. So here's something super cool. Whether you're going to do this or not, look up, because it's really cool. And you will learn this at the end of the semester. There's a tool in InDesign called the Page Tool, which is the second tool on the left here. And I have a blank page. And remember when I set up my document, document setup, my document measures 8 inches by 10 inches, because that's what we decided it was. If I'm on this blank page here in my page panel, that page is active. It's blue and I go to my page tool, notice I get these different kind of corners on my page here. Um, and I get to adjust the size of my page. It's telling me my page right now is 8 by 10. I can change it from custom to letter. And now it's an 8 and a half by 11 page. And if I go off the page tool, page 1 is 8 and a half by 11, but page 2 remains 8 by 10. Now that is cool, right? So if I go back to page one, Laura was asking how she does the XY coordinates because she didn't find a folder in the Artwork and Resources folder for the XY coordinate. What you need to do is this. You go to File, and you're going to place your PDF file in this page. Place. Locate your artwork and um, the chapter handout, but be sure to click Show options. Otherwise, it's only going to place page one. Go to show options and then click open and you get a new dialog box. And I can preview till I get to page two, which is the XY coordinates. And I say OK. And now my cursor loads because I'm placing the graphic. I just click, I don't need to drag to the upper left corner and it places at 100%. Now, some of you have written me emails that says, my artwork looks awful. Why does it look awful? That's because this is a picked display, a low resolution picture of this page. So I can go with that active to object display performance, high quality, and it sharpened my image. It's no longer rasterized. And then what I recommend you do while this is active is go to object lock so it doesn't wiggle around. And now, you can go to the Zoom tool, do this assignment, and you can create a little type box here um, and type the answer. And you create a little type box here and type the answer. And that's how you can complete this assignment more simply. Does that help you, Laura? Or did she leave? Did she walk out? Oh my gosh, I did that for her. OK. <laughs> she can see it on the video. She'll see it on the video. OK, so I'm going to save that. Now, what I'd like to do is continue going so you do have some class time um, and and um, Stevie was asking me about your next assignment back here that I'm grading. Um, oh, what chapter was the production sequence assignment? Three. Three. Oh, chapter three. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to do monsters super quick because Monsters is actually really easy, especially because they give you a template. And I have lots of tutorials on Monsters. But I'm going to show you what Stevie's struggling with Chapter 3, which is this. In Chapter 3, um, let me hit Cancel. 
actually, let me create a new document for chapter three. I'm going backwards right now. This is a little disorganized, I'm sorry. But I'm going to find the chapter three um, handout, I hope. You know what? It's not in there. But Stevie, look up here. I'm going to show you this super fast. In chapter three, they give you something called production sequence. And they give you a block of text. And um, I'm going to fill this with placeholder text because, Stevie, I think this is the thing you're struggling with. What they do in the chapter, in the production sequence assignment, is your text is a specific size. Let's say it's 10 point type on 14 point letting. I'm making this up. And then they take their first, and each of these is paragraphs, so I'm going to break my paragraphs in random spaces here so you can see what I'm talking about. And then what they do is for each of the paragraphs, they do something where the type hangs out, the first line hangs out to the left, and all the rest of the paragraph indents to the right. Right, Stevie? That's your question, right? Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's hard. So it's confusing. So all eyes look up here because you really don't want to miss this one. You'll find you'll use it a lot. I use it almost all the time. In, um, in the paragraph control panel, there's something called left indent. That one's obvious. I indent my type, it indents. But there's something called first line indent right below it. First line left indent. And it's counterintuitive because you want the line to hang out backwards to the left. So it's not, it's, when you type term papers now, how many of you hit a tab for your first paragraph? Like that. All right. So you no longer need to hit the tab. You can tell your paragraphs to indent the first line always without bothering with a tab. That's your first line indent, right? So I can turn this to zero, and I can still have my first line indent, right? Cool. No more tab. All right. This is different. This is where your whole paragraph indents, let's say, three quarters of an inch, but your first line out dents, doesn't indent. And that's a negative. So it's going to go negative whatever number they told you. And then what it also does is it also says you type a number, one, space, and then I think you highlight the first block of text and you make it red and then you go to the character panel and I believe Stevie am I right it's a small cap yeah and now it's small caps and that's what it looks like is that right did I miss anything that you had a question on uh, the whole filling in like the whole entire page with the color okay whole filling a page with a color is get a different box right here and I dragged my box, I made it yellow, I tinted it 20%, I took my box, I went to Object, Arrange, I sent it to the back. That's it. But then your type box has a red stroke around it. So I make my stroke active, I place a red stroke around my type box, let's say it's four points and it has a double rule, okay? Let me view this so you can see it better. But don't do this no-no. My text is inset and never touches that red line. So now with that box active, I go to Object Text Frame Options, and I inset my text so it doesn't touch the border. I don't know how much it's inset. You like that? There you go. So what was that again? Object. Object Text Frame Options, inset text. Now. I can highlight all of the rest of this text here, yes? And I can eye drop it, of course, or I can, um, to make sure it matches, or I can highlight, let's say this, and I drop my small caps and red, and I copy it for this paragraph, right? Don't need that type. Does that help you all? Um, so Stevie, is there anything else I missed on that one? No, you covered everything. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, so that one's a tough one, but I'll tell you why I use it a lot. When I have a client, um, I do a lot of bullets, like outline form things. And so I might um, choose to negative indent, let's see, indent less. Let me change my negative indent to zero for the moment. And let me indent just a quarter of an inch. And let me zoom in here so you can see what I've done. OK. So for here, for a bullet, for example, I'm going to make a tab, click tab right now. And watch what happens when I negative indent that line. Notice that now my text aligns with my text, and my bullet or my number hangs out, and it looks better. So I do that for bullets and numbering and stuff like that. And that's called first line indent, and it's a negative number to make it hang out. You tab it before you indent it? Didn't matter. I could tab it after. I can do that, and now just hit tab. And it aligns <coughs> automatically without me setting the tabs. Looks nice. looks nice, right? Yeah, it's clean. Clean, exactly. Super organized. OK, um, that's going a little backwards, but that was a tough one. All right, I want to do one more thing with monsters, which is fun. And I'm going to take. 11 minutes for that, and then we'll stop. And I'm going to use the monster template right now because the monsters is really easy. Here's the monster template. I opened it up. And the point of the monster template is this. Let's look at the assignment. Um, I will tell you John's a real stickler for the type, but John's a stickler for everything, so that's why we love him. And um, But what this is all about is placing the graphic making rounded corners, which they already do for you, which takes all your fun away, unfortunately. So I'm going to show you how to make rounded corners on your own. And then taking this graphic, pasting the same graphic in this little box, and moving the graphic around. That's the purpose of this assignment, really. And learning drop shadows, which is fun, too. So let me show you this. Let me show you this monster assignment in the Vicky way which would be um, drawing a rectangle. Let me, make a, let me make a new layer. Go to the layer panel. And OK, that's good. Let me lock this layer. Let me make a rectangle to mimic on this layer to mimic the one below. Answer key, look what we found. Um, OK. So I'm going to draw a rectangle about the size of this one, right? And then I'm going to draw one more little rectangle over here, plain rectangle. And then I'm going to turn off this bottom layer so all you can see is my current rectangles, OK? And I'm going to fill this rectangle with color just so you can see it and it's active so you can watch what I'm doing. So I'm going to pick a random color um, to fill it with. And why isn't it showing? Oh, I didn't make it active. There we go. All right. So let me show you how they made those rounded corners, which is the neatest thing since um, I don't know what. So when you click on a text box or a rectangle box or um, any box, any shape, whether it's a text box or an object box in InDesign, and you make it active, you have all these white corners, which is where you can make your box bigger or smaller. But you also get this little yellow thing. And if you click the little yellow thing, it puts little diamonds on the corners of your shape, of your object box. And if you look at, I'm holding my right hand up in the air because we don't want to see what's going on here. If I just drag in that corner, all my corners get round. And it tells you how big your rounded corners are. Fun, right? Or if I hold my shift key down, with my left hand, and I drag one diamond out, I can make some of my corners round and some of my corners not round. So I get a super cool shape like that. Isn't that super cool? I know, I think it's super cool too. So that's it. And that's how they made those rounded corners. Yes? I can. I No, actually, I can't. You can. Come on. We want Susan to have all the fun. Come on up here. 
and I'll tell you how to do it. Okay, so have a seat. So what Susan's going to do is with a black arrow active, with a selection tool active, she's going to make her box active by clicking on it. Okay. And then she's going to click on the little yellow symbol right here. Yep, and she's going to click on it, and that's going to edit corners, and now she's got diamonds in each of her corners. And if she just drags that any direction, she's going to round her corners. Okay, click on the diamond part, and click, and slide and knock yourself out. Make big rounded corners. Okay, let go. Perfect. Now if you hold your shift key down and you touch a diamond, one diamond, hold your shift key down and now drag it back, you're going to make it square. Great. Are you just so excited now? Thank you. I know. Yeah. Huh? Okay, yeah, Alberto. You can use the panel tool also. Right here? Yep. Yes. Oh, yes. You can make fancy corners. Yes. But it applies them. Um, yes. It gives you different edges. How do you change the size of it? Uh, that's such an excellent question. I have to look that up. I never use these, so I have to look them up. I don't know. Actually, my guess is, honestly, here's how you change the size. My guess is going to be right. Just by pulling your corners. That's how you change the size. Is that, your, is that answering you? Yeah. Most things are pretty intuitive in this software. So, okay. So, let me just show you the monsters super quick now. Um, so, let me go um, turn off this layer here. Lock, turn off, turn this one on. Now, we're in our monster assignment. And this is super, super fun. And basically, all it really requires of you is to, obviously, um, if we look at the assignment, the handout, you're going to typeset the type. This has that Greeking type down at the bottom. Follow the specifics for the characters. Notice the alignment and the sizes and proportions. I actually think it's horrible design because this price aligns at the top and the black aligns at the bottom. This one falls short of the top, which I think is horrible design. They've centered it to the box on the left, and then this one is at the top again. Typical Right. So bad design. It has bad design. If you mimic the bad design, it's okay. You won't get graded down. If you improve the bad design to align each of your numbers at the top, um, tell John. Personally, what I would do is I would make the number at the um, five here, and I'd put the word ticket down below here. Look at they made the type parking is bigger than new exhibits. Okay, this is where you have to really have an eye for how they set this up. I don't think they actually tell you the specs on it. I'm not sure. I don't believe they do. Yeah, John. This could have been designed by a committee so that when you go to change it, they won't let you because it will offend the person who makes parking off half the Yes, Alberto. I agree with you. I agree with you. You're absolutely right. Your comment, so it's on recorded for posterity, is it may be bad design, but they chose to do bad design in order to make you understand how to use the tools more effectively. And you are probably 100% correct. I commend you for observing that. It's good. But the fun part is, the fun part is you make, let me make sure my layer is not locked. Um, you make this text, this graphic box active. You go to file place. There is no magic to this. You go to the monster poster. And there is an EPS file, an encapsulated postscript file of the monster. You open it. Since the box is active, the monster gets placed inside the shape. And since Gen already asked you what the magic words are here, you go to object fitting, just like you did before, and you wish to fill the frame proportionally. And our monster sizes in to fill the frame proportionally. Now, this is the super easy part. Um, what you do here 
is I can click on this donut hole or lifesaver, whatever you want, even if I'm using my selection tool, and that's going to show me the content of the document. Notice the frame changed to brown, not blue. And I can just go to edit and I can copy it. Now follow this pretty clearly. I'm going to make the little box active and I'm going to go to edit and I'm going to paste into that little box because I've copied the monster, the big monster, and I'm pasting the big monster inside that tiny little box. Okay? And it did. Now what I have to do is go to my white arrow, my selection, my direct selection tool. I'm going to click on it, hold my mouse down, and you can see where my monster exceeds the boundaries of my box. And I can just move my mouse and move the picture while I'm holding my mouse down and now I can put the eye inside the box. And again, go to the black arrow, make the next box active, edit, paste into, go to the white arrow, hold my mouse down, I'll put the little critter in there now, and go to my next box, go to edit, paste into, hold my mouse down, and I'll put let's say his, his beak. John and I don't care what you put in those boxes as long as it's different for each one. Okay? Or that doesn't look very good, it looks redundant. So I'll put his hands in it, hands and feet. There, all right? And the rest is pretty, pretty simple because um, I have one minute more to go. But to make a drop shadow special effects on this wiggly line, you click on the wiggly line, you go to Window <coughs> Effects, and at the bottom of this panel, you see that it says Special Effects there. You click on the FX to create an object effects, drop shadow, and then they probably tell you the specifics of the drop shadow, but if you click preview, that's the default, and they might just leave it at the default drop shadow, unless they tell you other specifics for it. I guess I could look, right? Um, for the drop shadow effects. Add a drop shadow to the photo boxes and the starburst and the wavy line. Activate them select them, go to drop shadow, yeah, they don't tell you anything other than add a drop shadow, and say okay. Yes, John? You should have put this in the template on my site and compare your work to the finished piece because this one, a lot of these get kicked back. Okay, there you go. All right, so any other questions? I want to give you some free time to finish uploading and have John and I help you. Anything I missed? All right. So um, be sure, please, that you've uploaded all your assignments. I'm going to stop the video right now.